Hello, welcome back to the reading of House of Mirth by Edith Wharton. I'm Catherine. Today we will be reading chapter two of book two. In the last chapter, uh, Bertha Dorset has invited Lily to a Mediterranean cruise. And so that's what Lily's done. Her reason for being there is to keep Mr. Dorset happy because Bertha has, is having an intrigue with Ned Silverton, the poet. Ned Silverton doesn't have money himself, but he's invited along and paid for it for all these things. And uh, at the same time, we have Selden. Lawrence Selden has gone on a cruise as well, and he's gone to the West Indies and Cuba. But now they, that group has met in, in the Mediterranean, and they've specifically accidentally encountered each other in Nice in France. And I won't say too much more about the chapter. It's uh, the last uh, recording I did. There's a summary written, or you can listen to the video or watch it. So let's just get straight to the reading of chapter two. And I'll put these on. Miss Bart, emerging late the next morning from her cabin, found herself alone on the deck of the Sabrina. The cushioned chairs disposed expectantly under the wide awning showed no signs of recent occupancy, and she presently learned from a steward that Miss, Mrs. Dorset had not yet appeared, and that the gentlemen, separately, had gone ashore as soon as they had breakfasted. Supplied with these facts, Lily leaned a while over the side, giving herself up to the leisurely enjoyment of the spectacle before her. Unclouded sunlight enveloped sea and shore in a bath of purest radiancy. The purpling waters drew a sharp white line of foam at the base of the shore against its irregular eminences. Hotels and villas flashed from the grayish verdure of the olive and eucalyptus, and the background of bare and finely penciled mountains quivered in a pale intensity of light. How beautiful it was, and how she loved beauty. She had always felt that her sensibility in this direction made up for certain obtusenesses of feeling of which she was less proud. And during the last three months, she had indulged it passionately. The Dorset's invitation to go abroad with them had come at an almost miraculous release from crushing difficulties, and her faculty for renewing herself in new scenes and casting off problems of conduct as easily as the surroundings in which they had arisen made the mere change from one place to another seem not merely a postponement, but a solution to her troubles. Moral complications existed for her only in the environment that had produced them. She did not mean to slight or ignore them, but they lost their reality when they changed their background. She could not have remained in New York without repaying the money she owed to Trenner. To acquit herself of that odious debt, she might have faced a marriage with Rosedale, but the accident of placing the Atlantic between herself and her obligations made them dwindle out of sight as if they had been milestones and she had traveled past them. Her two months on the Sabrina had been especially calculated to aid this illusion of distance. She had been plunged into new scenes and had found in them a renewal of old hopes and ambitions. The cruise itself charmed her as a romantic adventure. She was vaguely touched by the names and scenes amid which she moved and had listened to Ned Silverton reading Theocritus by Moonlight as the yacht rounded the Sicilian promontories with a thrill of the nerves that confined her belief in her intellectual superiority. But the weeks in Cannes and Nice had really given her more pleasure. The gratification of being welcomed in high company and of making her own ascendancy felt there so that she found herself figuring once more as the beautiful Miss Bart in an interesting journal devoted to the recording of the least movements of her cosmopolitan companions, all these experiences tended to throw into the extreme background of memory the prosaic and sordid difficulties from which she had escaped. If she was faintly aware of fresh difficulties ahead, she was sure of her ability to meet them. It was characteristic of her to feel that the only problems she could not solve were those with which she was familiar. Meanwhile, she could honestly be proud of the skill with which she had adapted herself to somewhat delicate conditions. She had reason to think that she had made herself equally necessary to her host and hostess. And if only she had seen any perfectly irreproachable means of drawing a financial profit from the situation, there would have been no cloud on her horizon. The truth was, her funds, as usual, were inconveniently low. 
and to neither Dorset nor his wife could this vulgar embarrassment be safely hinted. Still, the need was not a pressing one. She could worry along as she had so often done before with the hope of some happy change of fortune to sustain her. And meanwhile, life was gay and beautiful and easy, and she was conscious of figuring not unworthily in such a setting. She was engaged to breakfast that morning with the Duchess of Beltshire, and at 12 o'clock she asked to be set ashore in the gig. Before this, she had sent her maid to, maid to inquire that she might see Mrs. Dorset, but the reply came back that the latter was tired and trying to sleep. Lily thought she understood the reason of the rebuff. Her hostess had not been included in the Duchess's invitation, though she herself had made the most loyal efforts in that direction. But her grace was impervious to hints and invited or omitted as she chose. It was not Lily's fault if Mrs. Dorset's complicated attitudes did not fall in with the Duchess's easy gait. The Duchess, who seldom explained herself, had not formulated her objection beyond saying, She's rather a bore, you know. The only one of your friends that I like is that little Mr. Bry. He's funny. But Lily knew enough not to press the point and was not altogether sorry to be thus distinguished at her friend's expense. Bertha certainly had grown tiresome since she had taken to poetry with Ned Silverton. On the whole, it was a relief to break away now and then from the Sabrina, and the Duchess's little breakfast organized by Lord Hubert with all his usual virtuosity was the pleasanter to Lilla, Lily for not including her traveling companions. Dorset of late had grown more than usually morose and incalculable, and Ned Silverton went about with an air that seemed to challenge the universe. The freedom and lightness of this ducal intercourse made an agreeable change from these complications, and Lily was tempted after luncheon to adjourn in her, the wake of her companions to the hectic atmosphere of the casino. She did not mean to play. Her diminished pocket money, money offered no little scope for that adventure, but it amused her to sit on the divan under the doubtful protection of the Duchess's back, while the latter hung above her stakes at the neighboring table. The rooms were packed with the gazing throng which in the afternoon hours trickles heavily between the tables, like the Sunday crowd in a lion house. In the stagnant flow of the mass, identities were hardly distinguishable. But Lily presently saw Mrs. Bry cleaving her determined way through the doors, and in the broad wake she left the light figure of Mrs. Fisher bobbing after her like a rowboat at the stern of a tug. Mrs. Bry pressed on, evidently animated by the resolve to reach a certain point in the rooms, but Mrs. Fisher, as she passed Lily, broke from her to towing line and let herself float to the girl's side. Lose her? She echoed the latter's inquiry with an indifferent gaze at Mrs. Bry's retreating back. I dare say it doesn't matter. I have lost her already. And as Lily exclaimed, she added, we had an awful row this morning. You know, of course, that the Duchess chucked her at dinner last night, and she thinks it's my fault, my want of management. The worst of it is, the message, just the mere word by telephone, came up so late that the dinner had to be paid for, the, and Bécassin had rung it up. It had been so drummed into him that the Duchess was coming. Mrs. Fisher indulged in a faint laugh at the remembrance. Paying for what she doesn't get rankles so dreadfully with Louisa. I can't make her see that it's one of the preliminary steps to getting what you haven't paid for. And I was the nearest thing to smash, and she smashed me to atoms. Poor dear. Lily murmured her commiseration. Impulses of sympathy came naturally to her, and it was instinctive to proffer her help to Mrs. Fisher. If there's anything I can do, if it's only a question of meeting the Duchess, I heard her say she thought Mr. Bry amusing, but Mrs. Fisher interposed with a decisive gesture. My dear, I have my pride, the pride of my trade. I couldn't manage the Duchess and I can't palm off your arts on Louisa Bry as mine. I've taken the final step. I'm going to Paris tonight with the Sam Gormers. They're still in the elementary stage, an Italian prince is a great deal more than a prince to them. And they're on the brink of taking a courtier to for one. To save them from that is my present mission. She laughed again at the picture. But before I go, I want to make my last will and testament. I want to leave you the prize.
Me? Miss Bart joined in her amusement. It's charming of you to remember me, dear, but really, you already are so well provided for? Miss Fisher flashed a sharp glance at her. Are you, though, Lily, to the point of rejecting my offer? Miss Bart colored slowly. What I really meant was that the brides wouldn't in the least be care to be care to be so disposed of. Miss Fisher, Mrs. Fisher continued to probe her embarrassment with an unflinching eye. What you really meant was that you've snubbed the brides horribly, and you know that they know it. Carrie! Oh, on certain sides, Louisa bris bristles, Louisa bristles with perceptions. If you'd even managed to have them asked once on the Sabrina, especially when royalties were coming. But it's not too late, she added earnestly. It's not too late for either of you. Lily smiled. Stay over and I'll get the Duchess to dine with them. I shan't stay over. The Gormers have paid for my salon lit, said Mrs. Fisher with simplicity. But get the Duchess to dine with them all the same. Lily's smile again flowed into a slight laugh. Her friend's importunity was beginning to strike her as irrelevant. I'm sorry I've been negligent about the brise, she began. Oh, as to the brise. It's just you I'm thinking of, said Mrs. Fisher abruptly. She paused and then bending forward with a lowered voice. You know, we all went on to Nice last night when the Duchess chucked us. It was Louisa's idea. I told her what I thought of it. Miss Bart assented. Yes, I caught sight of you in the way, on the way back at the station. Well, the man who was in the cage, carriage along with you and George Dorset, that horrid little Dabnum, who does the society notes from the Riviera, had been dining with us at Nice, and he's telling everybody that you and Dorset came back alone after midnight. Alone? When he was with us, Lily laughed, but her laugh faded into gravity after prolonged implication of Mrs. Fisher's look. We did come back alone, only if that's so very dreadful, but whose fault is it? The Duchess was spending the night at Simiez with the Crown Princess. Bertha got bored with the show and went off early, promising to meet us at the station. We turned up on time, but she didn't. She didn't turn up at all. Miss Bart made this announcement in the tone of one who presents with careless assurance a complete vindication, but Mrs. Fisher received it in a manner almost inconsequent. She seemed to have lost sight of her friend's part in the incident. Her inward vision had taken another slant. Bertha? Never turned up at all? Then how on earth did she get back? Oh, by the next train, I suppose. There were two extra ones for the fight. At any rate, I know she's safe on the yacht, though I haven't yet seen her. But you see, it was not my fault, Lily summed up. Not your fault that Bertha didn't turn up? My poor child, if you don't have to pay for it. Mrs. Fisher rose. She had seen Mrs. Bry surging back in her direction. There's Louisa. I must be off. Oh, we're on the best of turns externally. We're lunching together. But at heart, it's me she's lunching on. She explained... With her last hand clasp and a last look, she added, Remember, I leave her to you. She's hovering now, ready to take you in. Lily carried the impression of Mrs. Fisher's leave-taking away with her from the casino doors. She had accomplished, before leaving, the first step toward reinstatement in Mrs. Bry's good graces, an affable advance, a vague murmur that they must see each other, an elusive glance to a near future that she felt was to include the Duchess as well as Sabrina. How, thus Sabrina, how easily it was all done. If one possessed the knack of doing it, she wondered at herself, as she so often wondered, that possessing the knack, she did not more consistently exercise it. But sometimes she was forgetful, and sometimes she, could it be that she was proud? Today, at any rate, she had been vaguely conscious of a reason for sinking her pride, had, in fact, even sunk it to the point of suggesting to Lord Hubert Dacey, whom she ran across on the casino steps, that he might really get the Duchess to dine with the brides if she undertook to have them asked to the Sabrina. Lord Hubert had promised his help, and with the readiness on which she could always count. It was his only way of ever reminding her that he had once been ready to do so much more for her. Her path, in short, seemed to smooth itself before her as she advanced, yet the faint stir of uneasiness persisted. Had it been produced, she wondered, by her chance meeting with Selden? She thought not. Time and change 
seemed so completely to have relegated him to his proper distance. The sudden and exquisite reaction from her anxieties had had the effect of throwing the recent past so far back that even Selden, as part of it, retained a certain air of unreality. And he had made it so clear that they were not to meet again, that he had merely dropped down to Nice for a day or two, and had almost his foot on the next steamer, no, that part of the past, had merely surged up for a moment on the fleeting surface of events. And now that it was submerged again, the uncertainty, the apprehension persisted. They grew to sudden acuteness as she caught sight of George Dorset descending the steps of the Hotel de Paris and made for her across the square. She had meant to drive down to the quay and regain the yacht, but she now had the immediate impression that something more was to happen first. Which way are you going? Shall we walk a bit? He began putting the second question before the first was answered and had not waited for a reply to either before he directed her silently toward the comparative seclusion of the lower gardens. She detected in him at once all the signs of his extreme nervous tension. The skin was puffed out under his sunken eyes and its sallowness but paled to a leaden white against which his irregular eyebrows and long reddish mustache were relieved with a saturnine effect. His appearance, in short, presented an odd mixture of the bedraggled and the ferocious. He walked beside her in silence with quick, precipitate steps until they reached the embowered slopes to the east of the casino. Then, pulling up abruptly, he said, Have you seen Bertha? No. When I left the yacht, she was not yet up. He received this with a laugh, like a whirling sound in a disabled clock. Not yet up? Had she gone to bed? Do you know what time she came on board? This morning at seven, he exclaimed. At seven? Lily started. What happened? An accident to the train? He laughed again. They missed the train, all the trains. They had to drive back. Well, she hesitated, feeling at once how little even this necessity accounted for the fatal lapse of hours. Well, they couldn't get a carriage at once at that time of night, you know, the explanatory note was made almost seem as though he were putting the case for his wife. And when they finally did, it was only a one horse cab and the horse was lame. How tiresome I see, she affirmed with the more earnestness because she was nervously conscious that she did not. And after a pause, she added, I'm sorry, but ought we to have waited? Waited for a one horse cab? It would scarcely have carried the four of us, do you think? She stood, she took this in what seemed the only possible way with a laugh intended to sink the question itself in its humorous treatment of it. Well, it would have been difficult. We should have had to walk by turns, but it would have been jolly to see the sunrise. Yes, the sunrise was jolly, he agreed. Was it? You saw it then? I saw it, yes, from the deck. I waited up for them. Naturally, I suppose you were worried. Why didn't you call on me to share your vigil? He stood still, dragging at his mustache with a lean, weak hand. I don't think you would have cared for its denouement, he said with a sudden grimness. Again, she was disconcerted by the abrupt change in his tone, as, and as in one flash she saw the peril of the moment and the need for keeping her sense of it out of her eyes. Denouement, isn't that too big a word for such a small incident? The worst of it, after all, is the fatigue with which Bertha was probably slept off by this time. She clung to the note bravely, though its futility was now plain to her in the glare of his miserable eyes. Don't, don't, he broke out with the hurt cry of a child. And while she tried to merge her sympathy and her resolve to ignore any cause for it, in one ambiguous murmur of deprecation, he dropped down on the bench near which they had paused and poured out the wretchedness of his soul. It was a dreadful hour, an hour from which she emerged shrinking and seared as though her lids had been scorched by its actual glare. It was not that she had never had pre premonitory glimpses of such an outbreak, but rather because here and there, throughout the three months, the surface of life had shown such ominous cracks and vapors that her fears had always been on the alert for an upheaval. There had been moments when the situation had presented itself under a homelier yet more vivid image, that of a shaky vehicle dashed by unbroken steeds over a bumping road, 
while she cowered within, aware that the harness wanted mending and wondering what would give way first. Well, everything had given way now, and the wonder that the crazy outfit had held together so long. Her sense of it, of being involved in the crash, instead of merely witnessing it from the road, was intensified by the way in which Dorset, through his furies of denunciation and wild reactions of self-contempt, made her feel the need he had of her, the place she had taken in his life. But for her, what ear would have been open to his cries but for her? And what hand but hers could drag him up again to the footing of sanity and self-respect? All through the stress of the struggle with him, she had been conscious of something faintly maternal in her efforts to guide and uplift him. But for the present, if he clung to her, it was not in order to be dragged up, but to feel someone floundering in the depths with him. He wanted her to suffer with him, not to help him to suffer less. Happily for both, there was little physical strength to sustain his frenzy. It left him collapsed and breathing heavily to an apathy so deep and prolonged that Lily almost feared the passers-by would think it was a result of a seizure and stop to offer their aid. But Monte Carlo is, of all places, the one where human bond is least close and odd sights are the least arresting. If a glance or two lingered on the couple, no intrusive sympathy sub disturbed them, and it was Lily herself who broke the silence by rising from her seat. With the clearing of her vision, the sweep of peril had extended, and she saw that the post of danger was no longer at Dorset's side. If you won't go back, I must. Don't make me leave you, she urged. But he remained mutely resistant, and she added, What are you going to do? You really can't sit here all night. I can go to a hotel. I can telegraph my lawyers. He sat up, roused by a new thought. By Jove! Selden's at Nice. I'll send for Selden. Lily, at this, reseated herself with a cry of alarm. No, 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 she protested. He swung around at her distrustfully. Why not Selden? He's a lawyer, isn't he? One will do as well as another in this case like this. As badly as another, you mean. I thought you relied on me to help you. You do by being so sweet and patient with me. If it hadn't been for you, I'd have ended the thing long ago. But now it's got, it's got to end. He rose, suddenly straightening himself with an effort. You can't want to see me ridiculous. She looked at him kindly. That's just it. Then after a moment's pondering, almost to her own surprise, she broke out with a flash of inspiration. Well, go over and see Mr. Selden. You'll have time to do it before dinner. Oh, dinner, he mocked her, but she left him with the smiling rejoinder. Dinner on board, remember. We'll put it off till nine if you like. It was past four already when the cab had dropped her at the quay, and she stood waiting for the gig to out off for her. She began to wonder what had been happening on the yacht. Of Silverton's whereabouts, there had been no mention. Had he returned to the Sabrina, or could Bertha... The dread alternative sprang on her suddenly. Could Bertha, left to herself, had gone ashore to rejoin him? Lily's heart stood still at the thought. All her concern had hitherto been for young Silverton. Not only because in such affairs the woman's instinct was to side with the man, but because his case made a peculiar, a particular appeal to her sympathies. He was so desperately in earnest, poor youth, and his earnestness was of so different a quality from Bertha's, though hers was desperate enough. The difference was that Bertha was in earnest only about herself, while he was in earnest about her. And now at the actual crisis, the difference seemed to throw the weight of destitution on Bertha's side, since at least he had her to suffer for, while she had only herself. At any rate, viewed less ideally, all the disadvantages of such a situation were for the woman, and it was to Bertha that Lily's sympathies now went out. She was not fond of Bertha Dorset, but neither was she without a sense of obligation, the heavier for having so little personal liking to sustain it. Bertha had been kind to her, and they had lived together during the last months on terms of easy friendship. And the sense of friction of which Lily had recently become aware seemed to make it the most urgent that she should work undividedly in her friend's interest. 
It was in Bertha's interest, certainly, that she had dispatched Dorset to consult with Lawrence Selden. Once the grotesqueness of the situation accepted, she had seen at a glance that it was safest, the safest in which Dorset could find himself. Who but Selden could thus miraculously combine the skill to save Bertha with the obligation of doing so? The consciousness that much skill would be required made Lily rest thankfully in the greatness of the obligation. Since he would have to pull Bertha through, she could trust him to find a way, and she put the fullness of her trust in the telegram she managed to send him on her way to the quay. Thus far, then, Lily felt that she had done well, and the conviction strengthened her for the task that remained. She and Bertha had never been on con confidential terms, but at such a crisis, the barriers of reserve must surely fall. Dorset's wild allusions to the scene of the morning made Lily feel that they were down already and that any attempt to rebuild them would be beyond Bertha's strength. She pictured the poor creature shivering behind her fallen defenses and awaiting with suspense the moment when she could take refuge in the first shelter that offered. If only that shelter had not already offered it elsewhere, itself elsewhere. As the gig traversed the short distance between the quay and the yacht, Lily grew more than ever alarmed at the possible consequences of her long absence. What if that wretched Bertha, finding in all the long hours no soul to turn to, but by this time Lily's eager foot was on the side ladder, and her first step on the Sabrina showed the worst of her apprehensions to be unfounded. For there, in the luxurious shade of the after deck, that wretched Bertha, in full command of her usual attenuated elegance, sat dispensing tea to the Duchess of Beltshire and Lord Hubert. The sight filled Lily with such surprise that she felt that Bertha at least must read its meaning in her look, and she was proportionately disconcerted by the blankness of the look returned. But in an instant she saw that Mrs. Dorset had, of necessity, to look blank before the others, and that to mitigate the effect of her own surprise, she must at once produce some simple reason for it. The long habit of rapid transitions made it easy for her to exclaim to the Duchess, why, I thought you'd gone back to the princess. And this sufficed for the lady she addressed. If it sufficed for her, it was hardly enough for Lord Hubert. At least it opened the way to a lively explanation of how the Duchess was in fact going back the next moment, but had first rushed out to the yacht for a word with Mrs. Dorset on the subject of tomorrow's dinner, the dinner with the brise, to which Lord Hubert had finally insisted on dragging them. To save my neck, you know, he explained, with a glance that appealed to Lily for some recognition of his promptness. And the Duchess added with her noble candor, Mr. Bry has promised him a tip, and he says if we go, he'll pass it on to us. This led to some final pleasantries in which, as it seemed to Lily, Mrs. Dorset bore her part with astounding bravery, and at the close of which Lo Lord Hubert from halfway down the side ladder called back with an air of numbering heads, and of course we may count on Dorset too. And count on him, his wife assented gaily, she was keeping up well to the last, but as she turned back from waving her adieu over the side, Lily said to herself that the mask must drop for the soul of fear to look out. Mrs. Dorset turned back slowly. Perhaps she wanted time to steady her muscles. At any rate, they were still under perfect control when, dropping once more into her seat behind the tea table, she remarked to Miss Bart with a faint touch of irony, I suppose I ought to say good morning. If it was a cue, Lily was ready to take it, though with only the vaguest sense of what was expected of her in return. There was something unnerving in the contemplation of Mrs. Dorset's composure, and she had to force the light tone in with which she answered, I tried to see you in the morning, but you were not yet up. No, I got to bed late. After we missed you at the station, I thought we ought to wait for you till the last train. She spoke very gently but with just the least tinge of reproach. You missed us? You waited for us at the station? Now, indeed, Lily was too far adrift in bewilderment to measure the other's words or keep watch on her own. But I thought you didn't get to the station until after the last train had left. Mrs. Dorset examined her between lowered lids 
met with the immediately query, Who told you that? George, I saw him just now in the gardens. Ah, is that George's version? Poor George. He was in no state to remember what I told him. He had one of his worst attacks in the morning, this morning, and I packed him off to see the doctor. Do you know if he found him? Lily, still lost in conjecture, made no reply, and Mrs. Dorset settled herself indolently on her seat. He'll wait to see him. He was horribly frightened about himself. It's very bad for him to be worried, and whenever anything upsetting happens, it always brings on an attack. This time, Lily felt sure that a cue was being pressed on her, but it was put forth with such startling suddenness and with so incredible an air of ignoring what it led up to that she could only falter out doubtfully, anything upsetting? Yes, such as having you so conspicuously on his hands in the small hours. You know, my dear, you're rather a big responsibility in such a scandalous place after midnight. At that at the complete unexpectedness, at the inconceivable audacity of it, Lily could not restrain the tribute of an astonished laugh. Well, really, considering it was you who burdened him with the responsibility? Mrs. Dorset took this with an exquisite mildness. By not having the superhuman cleverness to discover you in that frightful rush for the train, or the imagination to believe that you'd take it without us, you and he all alone, instead of waiting quietly in the station till we did manage to meet you. Lily's color rose. It was growing clear to her that Bertha was pursuing an object, following a line she had marked out for herself. Only with such a doom impending, why waste time with this, these childish efforts to avert it? The puerility of the attempt disarmed Lily's indignation. Did it not prove how horribly the poor creature was frightened? No, by our simply all keeping together at Nice, she returned. Keeping together? When it was you who seized the first opportunity to rush off with the Duchess and her friends? My dear Lily, you are not a child to be led by the hand. No, nor to be lectured, Bertha, really if that's what you are doing to me now. Mrs. Dorset smiled on her reproachfully. Lecture you, I? Heaven forbid, I was merely trying to give you a friendly hint, but it's usually the other way round, isn't it? I'm expected to take hints, to take them, not to give them. I've positively lived on them all these last months. Hints, from me to you, Lily repeated. Oh, negative ones, merely what not to be and to do and to see, and I think I've taken them to admiration. Only, my dear, if you'd let me say so, I didn't understand that one of my negative duties was not to warn you when you carried your imprudence too far. A chill of fear passed over Miss Bart, a sense of remembered treachery, that was like the gleam of a knife in the dusk. But compassion, in a moment, got better of her instinctive recoil. What was this outpouring of senseless bitterness but the tracked creature's attempt to cloud the medium through which it was fleeing? It was on Lily's lips to exclaim, You poor soul, don't double and run. Come straight back to me, and we'll find a way out. But the words died under the impenetrable insolence of Bertha's smile. Lily sat silent, taking the brunt of it quietly, letting it spend itself on her to the last drop of its accumulated falseness. Then without a word, she rose and went down to her cabin. End of book two, chapter two.